Good morning Forex Baptist Church and welcome to our Sunday morning service. To all of our regular attenders, welcome back and a special welcome today to anyone who's watching for the first time. We have been so blessed over the last few weeks to watch our viewership on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page just continually grow and grow and grow and we feel incredibly grateful for all of the people who have joined us during this very difficult time. Um, we would love to meet you Unfortunately, at this moment in time, that's not possible. So what we've decided to do instead is today we are hosting a newcomers Zoom call. This will take place straight after our service, maybe 10 minutes to go and get a cup of tea. Um, so probably around 11.40, <clears throat> we'll be hosting a Zoom call. We would love for you to join us. It is completely informal. Just come along for a chat. Um, meet a few faces from Forex Baptist Church so that hopefully when you choose to come and join us um, after this this very strange time is over you won't feel as kind of out of it you'll know a few people um, and there'll be a few friendly faces there for you as well so that's 11.40 for any newcomers obviously any regular attenders who would like to meet our newcomers you are more than welcome to join us as well we're just going to start today's service by stilling our hearts and having a moment of silence. It's something that we've talked about quite a lot in our, in our church services over the last few weeks, but it's something I wanted to just mention because for me it is a really beautiful image that really helps me get through. And that is just that God is still as big as he ever was. In this very, very strange time where everything seems a little bit scary, God hasn't changed. He is still the giant, powerful, loving, beautiful God that he has always been. So we're just gonna take a time to focus on him. Everything else that's going on, just kind of put that to the side for a minute. Just lift that up and give it to God and just take a moment to, to still our hearts and have a moment of silence. Lord, we come to you this morning and we pray that you would let the Holy Spirit fill this place. Wherever, wherever we are in our own individual homes, maybe we're away from family, away from friends, but we just ask you to invite the Holy Spirit into our world, wherever it may be, um, and that it can fill our hearts this morning and that we can hear your message. Lord, we pray for everyone who's sick, all those people who are suffering with this horrible disease, we pray that you would be with them, that you would surround them and that they would be able to feel your love at this very difficult time. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for the people who are feeling isolated, people who are feeling alone. We pray that they would know your love, that you would be the loving, wonderful God that you are and that they would know that and know your friendship. And Lord, we pray for the key workers who are going out every day and putting their lives on the line, trying to help other people. We would pray that their kindness would inspire us um, and that we would be able to go out and in whatever way we could do your work. Lord, we pray for the children who are missing school, missing friends, missing family, um, children who don't understand what's happening, children whose school is their safe place and that's been taken away from them and we pray that you would watch over them during this very very difficult time and Lord we pray for the word um, that Phil is going to give us this morning we pray that we would open our hearts to your message God and that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that we would walk away from this morning feeling something new, something different, some kind of, you know, warmth and love from your strength, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. We're going to move into a time of worship this morning um, and we invite you to not just sit on your sofa and enjoy the music, but we invite you this morning to kind of stand and sing with us, dance around your kitchen, uh, you know, jump up and down, sing with us and uh, worship God this morning.
We're incredibly blessed to be coming to the point in our service uh, where we have our children's message. So if you have children in your household, um, gather them round. It's a chance for them to hear some stories from the Bible in a way that they can hopefully participate with and engage with um, and also a fantastic opportunity for them to take part in some um, crafts as well.
Hello everyone. Today we're thinking about the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is, is just God's love living inside us and we've got a chance to share that love with everybody, haven't we? Have a look at this candle. In this candle, it's quite a special candle, if you have a look, because it's got three wicks. Can you see that? This could be the church, and the three wicks could be the Father God, the Son, Jesus, and God's Holy Spirit. Three in one. So that's what we're thinking about today. Now, in our story, it's going to be the same story as last week because it's the same passage in the Bible that we're thinking about. Now, Jesus said, I am the way. Do you remember? The way. But he also said that he was going to go away. I think that must have made the disciples feel a little bit sad, don't you? So Jesus said, don't be sad because I'm going to send a helper, the Holy Spirit. And that will make you feel brave and it will make you have this lovely warm glow. And you'll be able to spread the glow to all your friends. What a fantastic thing that Jesus has given us, his Holy Spirit. So let's listen to the story and listen out for the part where it says that Jesus says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to my father said Jesus to his friends, said Jesus, I'm going away, but there are rooms in his house, more rooms than you can count, and I promise to take you there one day. But how will we get there? asked Jesus' friend Thomas. Said Thomas, show us we pray. Don't leave us alone. We don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? I am the way. Said Jesus to his friends. Said Jesus. I am the way. The Father's life and the Father's truth is in all I do and say. Then show us the Father, said Jesus' friend Philip. Said Philip, then all will be well. If you've seen me, said Jesus, you've seen him too. We've been together for years, can't you tell? I'm in the Father, said Jesus to his friends. Said Jesus, he's in me too. In the words I say, in the stories I tell, in the miracles you've seen me do. You will not be orphans, said Jesus to his friends, said Jesus. You won't be alone. My father will send you another companion, so you will not be on your own. His spirit will live within you, said Jesus. Said Jesus, within you he'll be. Then we'll all be one, Father, Spirit, Son, together for eternity. So, for our craft today, thinking about the Holy Spirit, we've made some paper dolls. Now, I don't know if you've made paper dolls before, 
So we've got how many of these? I think we've got eight here. Eight paper dolls in a row. And they've all got the Holy Spirit living inside them. Can you see that? So to make this craft, you will need some glue, some orange, red and yellow crayons, some tissue paper um, and some scissors and possibly some sellotape if it all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> so just quickly to show you how to make paper dolls. I'm sure we all have done this. So all the grown-ups probably did this when they were when they were small. So you just draw, I'm only showing you very quickly, you draw your your person and you make sure that the leg and the arm is attached to the edge of the paper. And with your scissors, you cut, oh no, you don't do that first. <laughs> First, you have to fold it. Silly me. So you have to fold it first. And it's a bit like when we made the um, the fish, the puffer fish, because you have to fold it backwards and forwards like a fan. So I'm going to fold it backwards and forwards. Like that. And then... When you cut it, make sure you cut um, well, you cut the head out. <laughs> you cut the head out, but then you must make sure that that arms are onto the folds. They have to be attached to the folds, otherwise the dolls will not be attached to each other. Now on both sides you can make the legs. Right, that, that was just a very, very quick demonstration, but as I say, I'm sure everybody knows how to make paper dolls to show the children. And then hopefully this works so they're all attached, so they're all holding hands. And all these people, children, Mummies, daddies, whoever they are. Oh, look, I've got two lots. They're all holding hands and they could be the church. You see that? They could be the church. Because the church is the people, not the building, isn't it? Now, to make our flames, we just draw a flame shape like this. And you can either colour them in, in orange and red and yellow. Or you could decorate them with tissue paper, like that. And then you just need a little dab of glue on the back of each flame and attach it to the person inside. Now, we haven't got round to decorating all the people, but they could be all different people from church. You could draw all your friends, you could draw your family, and everybody then has the Holy Spirit inside them. And that's a good reminder. And that would look so nice in our lounge at church, wouldn't it? To show all the people with the Holy Spirit. Hello. I'm trying to be in the dark. So hopefully you can see me. Did you listen to the part of the story where Jesus said that he would give you his Holy Spirit, give us his Holy Spirit. Did you hear that bit? Now, in our special song today, we sang that we are the church and we're shining in the darkness. And we also said that we've got the power to glow. The power to glow. The power is from heaven. It's from Jesus. The power to glow with God's love and to give it out to all our friends. So it's a little bit like having these glow sticks all the time in our hearts.
we feel braver don't we when we're in the dark but we've got a light do you like the dark or do you think it's a bit scary it can be a bit scary can't it if you're in the dark but if you've got a light even just a little light it really helps now i've got a little light here i'm going to use this little light to help us to say our prayer to finish off today so would you like to pray with me i'm going to start by holding my candle like this you could try this with a torch later on or maybe when you go to bed tonight you could try it in the bed in the dark are you ready for our prayer dear god wow you are awesome it's amazing that we can be friends with you and believers of jesus thank you for sending your holy spirit to fill us and give us power so that we can spread your love and strength to all our friends. And now I'm going to cover up the light and I'm going to say, sorry God, that sometimes we try to do things in our own power. Help us to glow and radiate your love to the world around us. And I'm going to shine the light and say, Amen. See you soon. We've come to the point in our service where we would normally take our offering. If you are a regular member of Forex Baptist Church, if Forex Baptist Church is the church that you call your own and you feel that you are in a position to give, then our account details are on the screen below. We thank you greatly for your generosity. We're aware that during this difficult time, many people may feel unable to leave the house. If this is you, please reach out to us. We have a special group um, designated to collecting prescriptions, to collecting shopping, and simply to having a chat on the doorstep if you're somebody who's feeling really lonely. You can contact us via our website or via our Facebook page, and we would be happy to help in any way we can. A number of our congregation have been isolating and we miss that group of people very, very much. But today we have a very special message from those people. Here it is. Today's reading is taken from Gospel according to St John, chapter 14, starting at verse 15. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, obey my commandments, said Jesus, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, 
who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognise him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me, and because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I am going to the Father, who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, you will believe. I don't have much more time to talk to you, because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me, so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, thank you, Chris, for an incredible uh, reading of our scripture for today. So as a church, we've been working our way through the Gospel of John uh, and uh, we've been reaching now essentially the pinnacle. This is where we're ending the story, uh, so to speak, over the next few weeks, possible months. This is the joy of taking a, a book and actually working our way through it. And so what we're trying to do with this, and if you've been with us so far, then obviously you'll know this. But what we've been trying to do is to read everything in context so as not to just pick and choose sections of scripture and then make it work towards uh, an agenda that we have. But actually in the other way around, what we're trying to do is explain this scripture explain why John felt it should be written this way, particularly when we begin to think that actually his writing of the gospel is actually quite a bit different to the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark and Luke. You see, what John's actually trying to do is he's trying to teach us a little bit about who Jesus is, uh, to tell us a little bit about who his character is. And as I've said all along this journey is that if I consider myself to be a disciple or to use today's language, to see myself as being an apprentice to Jesus, well then in order to, for me to be able to apprentice myself to him, to, to, to become like him, to learn everything he has to teach us, I need to learn about who he is as well. And that's one of the beautiful things about John's gospel is it shows us so much of the character of God, not just the things that he did, not just to prove him to be Messiah, but to actually teach us as to who he is, which is why we love John's gospel. So that's what we're doing. So we're working our way through this. And if you've been with us up to now, then uh, you'll, have, you'll be aware that, uh, that this is the Thursday. This is the Thursday before the Friday. Now, no genius is needed for that moment. Thursday obviously comes before Friday, but within the Christian faith, that Friday 
is Good Friday. That's the Friday that Jesus dies. This is the Thursday evening. And up to now, where we've been at, is we've just had Jesus sitting down and having a feast with his friends, something they've been looking forward to for a while. And Jesus begins to explain properly about his reasons for being here on earth. Then suddenly the penny is beginning to drop. And at the same time, a whole lot of other confusing things has happened as well. So if you've missed some of that, I want to encourage you just to go back and have a look at some of our backlog, uh, which you'll be able to find on pretty much any of our social media platforms, whether that's Facebook or YouTube. So today we're carrying on pretty much where we've uh, been uh, and, and where we've left off. And so uh, this section of scripture that we've just looked at is entitled, or at least it, it is uh, within the New Living Translation, as being Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. So there's two major things that's going on in this. Now, the obvious one is that there is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is quite exciting. And actually, if we're honest, it's exciting on a whole series of different levels. And I want to explain a little bit about that. See, our Christian calendar starts with Christmas. And we like Christmas. We like to give and receive gifts. This is a reminder that Jesus gave of himself, that, that God clothes himself in flesh and comes to dwell among us. It's what John explains. And this beautiful sense of God giving of himself, giving his only son, depending on what kind of uh, angle you look at it, this sense of gift, and so that we might eventually be able to have eternal life, a crazy gift far greater than any of us can wrap at Christmas time. So that's the concept. And then we then got uh, Good Friday, which leads us into Easter, which then leads us to Pentecost. But you see, actually, I think if we were to look at it properly, the concept, the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to rewrite the way that we interact with our God. You see, up until Jesus' arrival, the Bible was the Torah, which is the Old Testament. And it was, it was the whole concept of if you wish to live a life pleasing to God, Here's how. And it, because you love him, live like this. Which then so, suddenly became more of, in order for me to please and appease God, I have to live like this. So the love bit's gone, it's all about rules. So Jesus uh, and his whole ministry is to bring about a whole new way of doing things. And it's prophesied throughout that all men and all women, that no matter what your rank is in life, that you may be able to have the Holy Spirit, God himself, dwelling inside you, that he would write his law on your heart, the symbol of where your love is, the symbol of who you are at your deepest character, and that that is where uh, his law, his, his love, his character would be instilled in us. So, but in order for the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, Jesus has to successfully win a victory over death. So that we see is Easter. But in order for him to have a victory over death, he first of all has to die. That's Good Friday. Well, in order for him to die, he first must live, which is Christmas. So actually it's the whole thing around. And so what Jesus now is beginning to do is his whole dialogue has shifted in this last uh, week. And suddenly he's gone from, you know, where the disciples have been with him and he's teaching about what the kingdom of heaven is about and actually showing why God wants us to live this way, to, to do all these incredible miracles at the same time. He's been showing us so much about who God is. But suddenly, pretty much, within a chapter or so, everything shifts. Jesus now explains that his real purpose for being here is so that he's gonna die. He starts talking about that he's going to leave. And now we get a glimpse of what that means. So the first thing in this that we're gonna be looking at is that God promises the Holy Spirit. But there's also something else that's going on in this. And that is that actually over and over again, he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. 
so we're going to look at those two things. And I find it interesting that if we're honest, we get excited about the Holy Spirit. We get excited that, that Jesus is going to give us the Holy Spirit. What does that mean to us, especially now, you know, and especially in the, the world that we're living in and the culture that we're living in? And so we find ourselves kind of like looking towards that because it's a, a new thing. It's a gift. There's something exciting in it, which again taps into our kind of especially consumeristic mentality is like, oh, what more can I get? All right. So we look at that quite often in forsaking the other one because none of us like to be told what to do. None of us. It's has to me as well. So don't worry, you're in good company. But we don't. Now, we have friends who are in the police force and uh, uh, growing up, my dad was a policeman. And I tell you what, uh, when someone breaks into your house or does something to which you are hurt, injured, uh, that your property has been uh, vandalized or whatever, we want justice. So the police in that moment are wanted, needed, and appreciated. But that doesn't happen to us very often. So the rest of the time, the police quite often symbolizes being told what to do. There is a natural reaction when we're driving in our cars and we're obeying the speed limit and we see a police car, our stomachs do a whole twist and we find ourselves easing off. If you've ever been on a motorway and suddenly you're like, why has all the traffic got so heavy? And as you kind of follow it through, it's because everybody is scared to overtake the police car. There's that sense of fear of getting arrested. Uh, particularly at the moment, and I, I really feel for the police force at the moment, in the middle of our pandemic, they're the ones trying to police to make sure that we don't make this pandemic worse. So they're the ones who are trying to stop people from mixing uh, and, and, and therefore heightening the rate of uh, this pandemic, giving us a second wave where R goes up again and so i really feel for the police at the moment stuck between a rock and a hard place attempting to try and actually make the world better by stopping certain few who are definitely out to break the law and uh, when you read of some of the way that people just are, uh, are going about that so you think because it taps into that we don't like being told what to do and yet jesus three times within a matter of verses that we've just read, constantly keeps saying, obey, obey, and obey. I find that really interesting because if we're honest, even the title says, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say anything about obeying because actually even in the psyche, in the back of our mind, I do not want to be told what to do. And I'll obey if I feel that it's the right thing to do. There's so many things that go on in there. We're going to take a little bit of a look at the two of these things together as we work our way through. So that's the outlook of what we're going to be doing. Uh, let's jump into this. So, verse 15, our first verse reads as, If you love me, obey my commands. Okay, so if you love me, obey my commands, verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. It's almost like if you obey me, then you get the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's the way that he's wording this. Uh, and then as he goes on, uh, we hit verse 21. Uh, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. As we then jump through to verse 23, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them, and I love this, and we will come and make a home with each of them. Verse 24, anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. Okay, so note, Jesus isn't saying obey me, He's not saying, obey me out of fear. He's not saying, you will obey me. But actually what he's saying is probably even harder for us to swallow because he's saying, if you love me, then you will obey me. 
a couple of weeks back, we looked at uh, what the purpose uh, of all of this is, and this idea that like God loves you and me so much that he's prepared to wipe the slate clean, get rid of all of our baggage, we talk about this quite often, uh, and, and to wipe that slate clean so that we might be able to be moved from who we were into what God's calling us to, so that we are now a new creation. And I think if we grasp that and the gravity of that, if we can grasp those two things together, if we can grasp how amazing that is, our response should be, wow god i don't deserve this this is amazing and as we live in that moment of thankfulness we just love him he loves us first note and then our response is that we then love him and we then talked about that as we begin to love him we begin to see his heart is not just for me as the individual but it's for all that i know everybody around me and that i need to love others in exactly the same way see one of the main things that sets john's gospel above uh, and different uh, apart should i say that sets it apart from all the other ones is the fact that it actually concentrates so much on the love of god and how Jesus loves the Father, how the Father loves Jesus, how Jesus loves his disciples and those who follow him, and how the Father loves them. And it's just this kind of like sense of just actually it's love. So it's not I obey because I have to, I obey because I love. So uh, um, quite often as we're doing ministry together, uh, Nick and I co-lead this church together essentially and there's a, a beauty in that and and I love my wife I love spending time with my wife uh, it was our wedding anniversary uh, this week for those of you that joined us in our prayer meeting we finished off by saying and now we're gonna have a romantic meal for two uh, that because of delays of deliveries and stuff we didn't actually get our tea till about 10 o'clock but that's a whole different matter altogether but there's that wonderful thing I love actually just uh, although it was our anniversary we, and we haven't got a lot of money at the moment but we're like we're just we're gonna promise to have a great day and not spend a lot of money I couldn't help but buy my wife a gift there's that kind of like sense of like I just I love the things that she loves and so I want to be involved in that Nick's a real horse person and, and I love being around her and I love to be able to do that and there's something great about kind of doing stuff that I know brings her pleasure and the very thought of doing something that is going to hurt or upset her begins instantly to cause such an, an issue of, uh, of guilt and there's no way I want to do that if for me to do something that's going to cause her pain like that's not me loving her now if i can understand that within the broken aspect of human love when i realize what god has done for me and when i see how much he gave of himself and we're going to be reading of the brutality of this and if i'm honest i'm actually not looking forward to preaching the crucifixion because when i do i can't help but see the injustice of every slap, of every strike of the whip, with every drive of the nails that pierce my saviour. I can't help but go, God, you do not deserve this. My saviour did not need to do this, yet he chose to do it. And I'm not looking forward to preaching that because actually it begins to affect me and I'm aware of just how much I feel See, when I begin to understand the love of God and how much he loves me, I don't want to do things that hurt him. And I note that the times that I was doing the most damage to myself through sinful actions, to others, I was doing to God. And it's in those times that when I take a step back and actually see that it's in those moments that my relationship with God was not at its best. See, Jesus tells us to obey his commands because we love him. And when we put God first in our lives, there's a joy that comes with that. And we know we don't need to be kept being told what is right and wrong. Guys, you know it. You know, if you're living in a lifestyle that is not what God says in his scriptures that he wants you to live, I mean, you know it. 
Half the time we know it because those are the things that we try desperately to justify why it's okay. Yeah, but we live in a different culture or yeah, but things are different now to when it was or yeah, but I, I'm saved by grace. So we start to just grasp at straws in order to be able to justify the why. So we don't need to be told because we know. And if we truly love God, then we will obey. And, and it matters, it matters to God because as he's beginning to tell us about the joy of what he's about to bring into being, that the Holy Spirit is gonna suddenly, instead of it being for set individuals, how God kind of uh, comes upon somebody in, in history, whether that's Samson or, or, or whether that's Moses for a specific task, whether it's David uh, to write these incredible songs, whether it's Saul to particularly prophesy, uh, there's, there's something about God kind of coming upon an individual and it's usually for a time period and then it and then then God carries on doing what he's doing suddenly it's no longer for the individual but it's for each of us and this is the promise that God's bringing into being and yet in the midst of him promising the Holy Spirit three times within quick succession Jesus says if you love me if you love me then you will do this so for me, I can't help but go, actually, as much as the joy of the Holy Spirit is, actually, it's sandwiched in between just this repetitiveness. And note, every time that in Scripture, there's a particularly writing style, but note it's every time in Scripture God wants to grab our attention, he says something once, then he says it again, and then he says it again. Now, as a dad, I get that. You see, quite often... I can be so swept up in my interior thoughts and my mind and what's going on, what jobs I've got to do, you know, what sermons I'm still midway writing, you know, what list of activities I need to do in the house, around the house, out the house, who I need to write emails to. There's a list just constantly, just ticking around. And although I'm spending time with my kids, I'm very aware they quite often have to say my name, not once, because for some reason, hasn't quite clicked. Twice, might be starting to pay attention. By the third time, I'm there. That's actually a shame that I have to admit that, but it's true. It's like, dad, dad, dad. And I'm like, what? I'm here. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, but I said your name twice and you weren't listening. It's that sense of like, you know, like God understands that's human nature. Because quite often the battle that's waging in our mind is sometimes far greater than that's actually attacking us externally. So Jesus is doing exactly the same thing. Please note it is a dad, dad, dad moment as he's saying, if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, then you will obey me. If you love me, then you will obey me. And those that don't love me will not obey. So I want before we go any further and please don't just shelve this and just pop it into that part of your mind to say okay i will deal with this later grab a piece of paper write a note if you're someone that the journals as you're as you're listening to sermons and talks and um podcasts and and, and the likes then then i you know make sure that you underline this the need to obey like what are you aware that as, I, as we're talking that the holy spirit's saying guys sort this out then do it. Whatever the cost of that is, if you know that something in your life isn't right, put it right. Not because Phil says, not even because Jesus says, but because actually you love God and you want to do right by him. Because I think if I begin to understand the gravity of what God has achieved, and what he give, did, what he gave up for me, for you. When I begin to realize that for myself, my reaction has to be, I don't want to further throw more sin, more shame, more guilt at Jesus' feet because that just does him a disservice. So make sure that that's something that you deal with. Maybe it's at the end of this, maybe it's later on, but this is crucial. As a, I'm 
really loving the way that all of our meetings are kind of coming together. There's just same themes just seem to be like cropping up left, right, etc. And uh, if, if you don't, uh, if you're just somebody that watches the Sunday services, you'll, you'll have missed out on some of these themes that are going through. But we've got loads of stuff that's that's going on at the moment. Uh, we last on Sunday evening just gone. We uh, we did communion, and, you know, and as a church, we've just done the Last Supper, uh, and then suddenly we're sitting down and actually then doing communion, which is the Last Supper. There's something beautiful in that, and especially when we begin to look at it within the the larger scape of things. We've been looking as a church in our studies uh, that go out on uh, Thursday afternoons uh, of this idea of, you know what, uh, James throughout his uh, his letter just goes through and gives us so much information. We've been taking that apart and kind of looking at it. And again, the same theme even that we've just looked at is that actually God calls us to a life of repentance, that God calls us to be sorting stuff out in order for us to be able to live the wonderful life that God's got for us, means for us to lay down some of the stuff that we're carrying that we shouldn't be so that we may be able to pick up some of the stuff that God wants us to be running with. That ties in so well with our prayer meetings that are happening on a Tuesday evening. And all of these you can, you can watch on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, go back and, and look at this, but the same themes seem to be working our way in. And, and it's not because uh, I'm, I'm engineering this to happen. It's just, I love when you begin to look at scripture in its, in its hugeness, that actually those same themes are just there. It's that overarching story. So now then he promises the Holy Spirit, and this is what's exciting. Now he doesn't go into a great deal of detail with this, but he begins to explain a little bit. And as we go through, he begins to explain more until eventually he gives the gifts of the Holy Spirit once he's died and risen again. So what we're looking at here is this, uh, this sense of God saying, don't worry. And I, I really want for us to grasp this. I mean, last week we started off in chapter 14 and the very first verse says, don't let your hearts be troubled. But he then goes on and explains the purpose of the Holy Spirit. So in verse 17, uh, he says that he, that he, talking about the advocate, which he's just promised, uh, will lead to truth. Explains that the world can't understand it because it's not actually looking for him. Uh, and then uh, goes on and says that... Uh, verse 26 but when the father sends the advocate as my representative that is the Holy Spirit he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you this is why inviting God to dwell in you inviting the Holy Spirit to come and fill you is crucial if you want to live a life that honors him it's like saying to God Lord I, I need you and I, I don't know about you but like uh, I quite often feel uh, a little bit like a jar with like holes in it that, that there's times when I just feel really full like I've just I, I, I've met God and it's great and it's wonderful but 24 hours later I'm a leaky vessel uh, and I'm back to feeling dry spiritually and if you understand that sense that actually that, that we're supposed to remain in the presence of God which means we're constantly be being filled like just the the, the 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 constant aspect of it but then in verse 27 this is the beauty of this what is he leaving verse 27 I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart and the peace I give you is a gift that the world cannot give so don't be troubled or afraid and then again he goes on to explain that, that he's about to leave and that's this, this this whole dialogue these promises and commands are all seated within this him explaining that he's about to go away. Now, you can understand from the disciples' perspective when suddenly everything's felt amazing and that they've just witnessed the most craziest miracles. They've just seen Lazarus, someone who's been dead for three days, being brought back to life. You can understand why they're just excited. They've gone into Jerusalem and the city's gone nuts. Like, then suddenly Jesus begins to talk about, actually, he's about to die. 
he's about to go, he's about to leave. Uh, and there's this whole like anxiety and fear that's beginning to build within them. Simon Peter has just been told that even before the night is through, he's going to deny Jesus three times. Judas has just suddenly got up and left. And some of them are beginning to realize just the sheer gravity of that because he's going to betray him. Like just, I wouldn't want to be in that scenario as the penny's beginning to drop that things are about to shift and it's not going to be the way it's been for the last three years. What's Jesus doing? Well, he's telling them not to worry, not to let their hearts be troubled and then to say that I'm leaving you with a gift. This is the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace for your mind and heart to not be worried. Like, I don't know about you, I need that. I mean, I've talked openly of, of struggles with uh, days being great, days being hard, and there's no understanding as to why I'm in a low day, but I'm, I'm in one. And, and for me to, in those moments, it's dead easy for me to give in. I've lived with anxiety for years, uh, and I know what it's like just for your heart to feel troubled. I get that. But the peace that God gives, when we allow it to enter our hearts, when we allow God through the power of his spirit to speak to us, like stuff begins to shift. And this is what Jesus is promising. So as we move now into our conclusion, as we bring it all together to one defined point, it's this. The first bit is that God is calling us to a life of obedience. It matters three times. That's why he's shouting, dad, dad, dad. It's that moment of saying, if you love me, obey me. Which means that actually is in a life of obedience. It means putting down the things that we once did to choosing to live as our Bible tells us to. It's telling us to, to, to live a, a life that is different to the world around us, to the norm that is out there. And instead to live in a new form of community that we would be known to be different by the way we live, by the way we interact with others, and by the way that we love him. And that is the crucial part. And it comes back to love again as we truly begin to see him for who he is and we love him we want to be living the way he wants us to and as we love him we want to and then god says and as we do that then he will come and make his home within us and this is where the holy spirit comes in and dwells within us Today, I, you need to know that God wants to inhabit you, that God wants to change you. And so whether you have been a Christian for years or whether this is completely new to you, he wants to beckon you from your old life and into a new life that he has for you. So these essentially come, these two points that John is talking about in these few verses, all center on this one point of love. God loved you so much that he was prepared to lay everything aside for you. And now our response is that we love him. And as we love him and come to meet him, he fills us with his spirit. We are transformed. So there's two groups of people I'm talking to today. The first one is maybe, you know what? Maybe this is completely new to you. Maybe this is all, you know, new language and it's quite scary as you're listening, but you're thinking, do you know what, actually, I need this. I recognise that actually in my pursuit of things, I've made a mess. I've hurt other people and I've hurt myself. And as we realise, actually, if God loves me the way that I'm saying that he does, then I've clearly hurt him too. So if that's you, I want you in your own words 
And that might be just literally pressing pause in a moment and doing business with God. And it might be just praying something that goes along the, the lines of this, that you're saying, you're recognizing, you have a need for God, that you can't do this on your own. And you're saying that actually I've made a mess. I've tried to live my way and I know I've hurt myself. I know I've hurt others. I know I've hurt you. So that's recognizing where you are. And then it's to say, God, I'm sorry. That's called repentance. Lord, I don't want to live like this anymore. Again, that's then just you saying, I'm not going to live like this. This is coming into that life of obedience and then saying, God, would you fill me with your spirit? Just four points. Would you come, would you fill me with your spirit? So if that's you, you know, after you've prayed that prayer, I want you to direct messages as a church because we would be privileged, honored, so excited to walk this journey with you, wherever you are. You don't have to even be in our Four Rocks, Mere Green area. You know, wherever you are, we would be privileged to walk this journey with you. And once this is over with, maybe even hook you up with a church that's closer to home for you. Second group of people is this, you know, that you've been a Christian for years. And as we've been working our way through this just today, there's that element of conviction and recognizing, do you know what? I need to do right with God. Then I want to encourage you to do that. Maybe that is the same thing, pressing pause. But to basically pray through those same things again, just to recognize that actually we do make a mess as we as we walk away and we run after our own dreams, that instead of living a life worthy and honorable to him, we don't this ties in so well with our talk on james this week so i just want to encourage you where you are to do business with god so my prayer and hope for you as a as, as a church dotted around in the homes all over the place is that we as believers may come to know god for who he is and may come to love him for who he is and that would want to please him and do right by him. We're going to finish by singing a final song, but maybe just using the words of this song, uh, just I want to encourage you to do business with God and message us. Let us know how we can walk with you in these times to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, that you love us. Lord, I thank you for the way that you just pour out blessing upon blessing and we do not deserve it, yet you still give it. And Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, we want to live in a way that is honourable to you. Lord, again, you keep asking us to obey. Lord, we are excited by this sense of just peace that comes with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we know we need that peace in our hearts. Lord, just to wipe away anxiety, that heaviness of life, Lord, we need that in our life. So God, as a church, we just say, we are yours. Holy Spirit, would you come and work afresh in us as a church and as individuals? corporately together we ask this in jesus name amen
We hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. Um, normally we would be inviting you to stay for tea and coffee. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that this morning. But we do invite you to go and get yourself a cup of tea and to reach out and talk to us. We would love to hear from you. You can contact us on our Facebook page, um, via our website, via our email. And if you are a newcomer today, don't forget our newcomer Zoom call will be happening in around 10 minutes time. I hope you all have a lovely week. Goodbye from Four Oaks.